Salam Sungu People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani and you're watching Daily Debrief. We're continuing our roundups for the year 2022. Uh, and today we're talking about public health, uh, a major issue, of course, as the world uh, attempts to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. It's the third year of, uh, uh, since the pandemic, out, uh, the uh, outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, and it's been uh, a difficult period of recovery for, uh, I think, pretty much the entire world. Uh, we're going to be talking about that, of course, and other issues, including uh, outbreaks of other diseases, as well as backlogs in the treatment of other major public health uh, issues, as well as movements around the world uh, for the rights of public health workers. Uh, and joining us to talk about all of these subjects and more is Anna Vrachar of the People's Health Movement, uh, who is now in Croatia. Anna, good to have you on the show once again, uh, perhaps for the last time for 2022, uh, talking about all the big stories that we've covered actually through the year uh, in some detail. Uh, let's start off with the pandemic, Anna, if that works for you. Um, what is your understanding of where we are in terms of uh, the COVID-19 situation at present? Uh, news of, of course, uh, new uh, outbreaks in China, uh, dominating the headlines from that perspective uh, these days. But, but just from a, in, a, in a wider sense, where, where are we at with regard to the pandemic? Right. And, uh, you know, as you rightly said, this is the third year of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I think that many people will have noticed that, that uh, things have changed. So headlines have changed. The approach to COVID has changed. It's not so much, uh, it's not such big news anymore. Yeah. Uh, but, you, you know, uh, 2022 was a big year for the pandemic because we have seen uh, some of the initiatives that were launched already in 2020 uh, we saw them wrap up and we saw them wrap up uh, in a way that we didn't want to, in a way that we didn't want to, to see happen. Mm. So, you know, uh, if we look back at 2020 and at how activists uh, responded to the first COVID-19 uh, outbreaks uh, was, um, was a kind of worry uh, that the response in different parts of the world would would vary uh, and that uh, they would vary uh, depend, uh, depending on how much money uh, was concentrated in the region. And of course, very early on in the pandemic, we saw that these activists were right and that people in Europe, in the US, uh, in Australia, uh, in the global north, essentially, were getting early access to, uh, to, re to medical resources that everybody needed. Uh, this is something that some countries in the global south uh, tried to oppose, so they tried to step up uh, and fight for uh, uh, for changes for let and let me underline that for temporary changes to IP mm -hmm. rules at the World Trade Organization uh, that would allow them uh, to have more access to vaccines that could say that could have saved millions of lives, literally millions of lives could have been saved had the COVID-19 vaccines been more accessible in Africa and in other parts of the global south. So uh, 2022, uh, unfortunately, was not the year when this happened. Uh, we saw that the global north again uh, stroke uh, against this kind of initiatives and they uh, ha really held strong in defending the interest of big pharma companies uh, of their profits uh, instead of siding with the people of the world and and, uh, and protecting their lives. So, uh, of course, you know, um, the big thing was that uh, there were some uh, let us put it my, minor uh, minor things allowed wh when it uh, when it came to access to vaccines and this was done more more or less from a humanitarian perspective and uh, big pharma companies committing to this and to that uh, to you know donating uh, vaccine doses uh, but then backing up on those promises or not fulfilling them. Uh, in, in the way that was uh, that was foreseen. We had seen donations from Global North countries going to the Global South only to find out that the doses donated were a near expiry, so it, they were impossible to use. So, uh, you know, it wasn't really a good year for COVID-19 response. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it is uh, wrapping up in the same way that it started. So now once the vaccines uh, have made once the discussion about the vaccine has maybe toned down a bit mm. uh, and people are now turning to discussions that uh, relate to to COVID-19 medication and diagnostic testing, uh, 
uh, we are seeing the same thing repeating. So global North countries that uh, at uh, at the discussions at the WTO said that okay, so let's um, let's do some um, let's do some steps forward when it comes to vaccines, but not commit to the same when it comes to diagnostics and and drugs. Uh, they are now. Uh, walking back on their promise to reconsider this and to you know to consider expanding the things that they have agreed upon uh, for vaccines uh, and to to apply them when it comes to other kinds of medical products too so they're uh, very likely uh, backing up on that and not actually doing anything to to aid uh, the response to to a pandemic which is still ongoing hmm. Yeah, uh, and 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 we'll of course wait for 2023 to see uh, how that proceeds, Anna. But but uh, what you highlighted, I think, is it has been a sort of late motif uh, in all of these shows that we've done. We were talking uh, about the energy sector the other day with Prabir Prakasa, and and there too uh, we found where that the central theme was a, a focus on the interests of capital versus. Uh, very starkly versus uh, the needs of of humanity at large, of course. Uh, whether even when you're looking at uh, within a country itself, uh, and some of that approach has led to the outbreak of uh, other communicable diseases, and over the course of the year that we seem to have under control. Yeah, uh, and of course, you know, it has impacted. Uh, the progress that we wanted to make uh, when it comes to diseases that have been here for a long time and that have caused millions and billions of deaths. So uh, a couple of reports came out uh, during 2022, including global reports on tuberculosis and on HIV AIDS. And both of these reports show that there is virtually no progress when it comes to the targets that we want to achieve. Uh, for for a set year, say 2025 or 2020, uh, 2030. So these are the things that the global community has set as glo global public health priorities. Mm. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine progress uh, and people fulfilling their right to health uh, if we're not able to make any progress on, on these fronts. Uh, but now the, the reports are saying that we're nowhere near the target and we do have a very good idea why uh, this is so. Uh, for example, investment in tuberculosis research and development uh, has been staggering way, way, way behind what we wanted to see and what is needed to actually make progress. So um, the basically the diseases that are perceived as diseases of the poor uh, mm. as diseases that do not do not affect lives in the global north are still not prioritized by uh, by the big pharma companies uh, instead that they are they are turning to developing drugs uh, the developing drugs that can be marketed uh, again in Europe in the yeah. US yeah. that can be sold at a higher price mm. and then of course you know while we're talking about these things I think we shouldn't forget uh, to mention the social determinants of health, mm -hmm. which have worsened a lot uh, this year as well. You know, hunger has been one of the most talked about topics, I guess, for the last couple of months and the growth of hunger around the world, especially especially in Africa, where uh, millions of people are facing uh, shortages of food uh, and cannot, uh, you know, you know, cannot access the very basics they, they need to survive. Uh, and all of this is intertwined with some of the d diseases that we thought we might have put under control in some places. Um, for example, one of the most recent cholera outbreaks in Lebanon uh, show, is an exa example of exactly this. So uh, cholera uh, is not, um, you know, it's not... Uh, it's a disease that has a lot to do with living conditions. If you don't yeah. have access to clean water, if you don't have access to facilities that allow you to process the food that you have, uh, to actually access food, um, to boil the water, uh, all of this puts you at risk. And if, you know, we know that if these things are not under control, then it's, 
it's a very good indicator that people are living in very dire conditions. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is not only true for Lebanon, it's true also for the neighboring Syria, of course. It's true for Haiti, it's true uh, for the Democratic Republic of Congo. So in many places where we see conflicts uh, intertwining with other, uh, with other uh, crises and catastrophes, uh, we are seeing worrying results when it comes to communicable diseases and mm. other diseases that we hoped uh, would be eradicated by now. Uh, over the past three years, Anna, Dr. Tedros and the WHO have become uh, household names. Uh, and yet we've talked often on, on this show and elsewhere on People's Dispatch uh, about how shackled the functioning of the World Health Organization uh, itself is. Uh, if we can conclude this section uh, with a little bit from you on uh, what, how you see uh, that process developing as the organization that has been globally mandated to uh, determine uh, our priorities as, as, a, as a species, I guess. Uh, how, how will uh, any ma major developments expected on that front uh, for the upcoming year? Well, uh, it's, uh, this is an interesting question also because uh, there is only a month to go until the next executive board of the WHO, which, uh, which should happen in Geneva. Uh, and, you know, of course, mm, People's Dispatch has covered what has been going on at the WHO for, for many years now. Uh, and unfortunately, it's pretty much always the same thing. Uh, we have a lack of funding. We have uh, member states who are not ready uh, to uh, walk the talk, as they like to put it, uh, and put their funds behind the programs that the WHO actually finds necessary to, to fulfill, fulfill its duties. Uh, and then to blame the WHO for not fulfilling the, its duties because, uh, because, well, who knows why. Uh, but so it's been uh, it's been an interesting year for the WHO, of course, because of the pandemic and because they um, the the agency uh, launched the work on what is commonly now known as the pandemic treaty. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, the pandemic treaty is also something that uh, that's quite interest that that cause that's still causing quite a bit of interest in global health circles. Uh, it still makes headlines when uh, every every time that that the WHO meets or or anything of the sort. Uh, but there are still questions open about how how much this international treaty will be uh, able to help the world in responding to future crises as the as COVID-19. So, uh, you know, many people, many activists uh, have highlighted that what we need now is building uh, a system that is based on solidarity, on international solidarity, on responsibility, uh, on the people uh, who have caused mo most of the damage and damage. who have profited uh, most of, of the damage. Uh, there are spaces opening up. There are still pressures from progressive groups uh, and attempts by pro progressive alternative groups, left uh, left wing groups, uh, to take the WHO back to where it was before and to actually make it stand for the health for all that uh, that we know from Alma Ata. Yeah, for and 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 speaking of uh, sort of uh, uh, that aspect of the broader public health systems, uh, they are based, of course, on the work that is put in by uh, those who are involved in uh, building, keeping up that system. Whether it's uh, you know the uh, Anganwadi uh, and ASHA workers in India uh, and and many other such organizations around the world that uh, often at very low pay and in and in uh, frontline situations like we saw during the pandemic, of course. Uh, are, are working despite the system to make sure uh, as many people as possible have access to uh, at least some kind of healthcare. Uh, it was an active year for uh, organized workers in the healthcare sector. Take us through some of that and also what you expect uh, in the year to come. Uh, yes, I think that's uh, that's one of the most inspiring parts of the health year, but also one that you know that uh, that uh, calls to caution. Because we have seen different trends, so uh, let's maybe let's start with the, with the more negative ones. We have mm -hmm. seen that you know health workers, uh, especially health workers working uh, in under repressive regimes, uh, in conflict situations, are still being targeted. So we have seen health activists in Palestine, in the in the Philippines, uh, in the uh, in DRC, 
uh, being targeted, being persecuted, some of them being arrested, some of them being killed. Mm. So, you know, 2022 was the year when Shara Ode, uh, a health activist from Palestine, uh, who's also a nurse, uh, she was finally released from jail after spending almost a year in an Israeli prison uh, because of some trumped up charges against uh, one of the organizations that it's uh, responsible and that provides essential health care to thousands of Palestinians. So these, these are thousands of people that would go without medical care uh, if left to, to these Israeli occupying forces. We have seen health workers in the Philippines being red tagged and, uh, and killed because of the work they do. So this is something that, that the world has to look at more, uh, more attentively in 2023 uh, and make it a priority that uh, health workers who put so much, uh, so much of their lives on the line for protecting people uh, that, you know, they should have access to, uh, to the same amount of protection themselves. Mm. And it also well, ties in what we were talking about earlier because a majority of the workers in the healthcare sector are women, of course. Yes, yes, definitely. So, uh, and that's, uh, I think, also a very good connection to uh, towards the positive side of it. You know, mm. uh, especially now, uh, as the year comes to a close, we have seen an enormous wave of strikes among health workers, especially nurses, mm. all around the world. So this is something that has been building up during the pandemic, because, you know, uh, if, again, let's look back at 2020, uh, when health workers were commended for their work uh, by people who were applauding them from windows. Yeah. Uh, and the same health workers already then saying that this was not enough, that, you know, before the pandemic, they needed more. And mm. now, during and after the pandemic, uh, they will need even more. And so now uh, we are actually facing the consequences of governments not reacting to the calls of health workers. Uh, we have seen a series of strikes, uh, I think, essentially in, in all parts of the world. So there, uh, recently there, there was uh, a major strike uh, in Minnesota by uh, some 15,000 nurses. Mm. Uh, currently in Europe, we are seeing uh, one of the biggest, if not the first, the biggest strike of, of nurses in the British uh, National Health Service. Yeah who are fighting for a fair pay rise. Uh, we are hearing about announcements of strikes by doctors in Kenya. Uh, there have been actions by health workers uh, in Argentina, uh, in Brazil, in uh, South Africa, in uh, different parts of Europe. So, um, you know, you already mentioned that also uh, South and Southeast Asia yeah. were also uh, uh, also places where, uh, where health workers took to the streets. Uh, and this is something that I hope is going to continue because it's the only way that's going to actually lead us, uh, lead us somewhere and lead us to better public health systems. So, uh, you know, if we look at uh, the nurses who are striking now uh, uh, in Britain, they have already received uh, thousands of letters of support from many parts of the country, but also outside. So, you know, uh, this is one, one other thing that uh, provides hope is mm -hmm. that uh, the struggles that are taking place now, they're inspiring international solidarity. And so uh, people now, uh, even in Europe, are looking finally at the similarities uh, in the health systems that they have and saying, okay, but so uh, these similarities uh, and the problems that we are experiencing, they come from the same place. So yes. let's work together uh, and and change 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 those things. Right. Uh, on, on that hopeful note uh, and the call to change, Anna, we'll bring to a close this episode of uh, the show. Uh, we'll have you back with us, uh, I'm sure, very early in 2023 to talk more about uh, some of these issues, of course. Uh, thanks very much for your time today uh, and I hope you have a good close to the year uh, and we'll see you very soon. And uh, that, like I was saying, is a wrap for this uh, public health roundup of 2022 uh, from the team here at People's Dispatch and Daily Debrief. Uh, we'll be back, of course, tomorrow with another episode. Uh, until then, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on all of these stories, including uh, some 
uh, stories that Anna uh, herself has written on the website uh, covering various aspects of public health uh, and the movements uh, around it. Uh, also we invite you to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.